Starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us here today. My name is Tawny Samiski. I'm an entomology specialist with UMass Extension, and I'm excited to welcome back those of you who joined us last week, as well as those of you who are joining us for the first time uh, today uh, as a part of our Invasive Insect Webinar Series. This series uh, is brought to you through a collaboration between UMass Extension's Landscape Nursery and Urban Forestry Program, as well as our Fruit Program. And these webinars are made freely available to you through funding support by the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So we thank them for their support as well. I also want to introduce to you today uh, Jeffrey Jouet, who is here um, uh, from UMass Extension helping with tech support for our webinar. So Jeffrey, could I bother you to advance the slide? All right, thank you. So before I introduce our speaker today, I do want to give a few reminders about pesticide and association credits. Um, for those of you who are seeking those as a result of watching today's broadcast. So all instructions for receiving the pesticide credit uh, for mass categories 26, 27, 29, 35, 36, and the applicator's license or the core license, uh, as well as uh, association credits for MCA, MCLP, ISA, and SAF, will be shared at the very end of this webinar. So I ask that you please remain on the webinar until the end to receive these instructions, as well as to take the quiz for the pesticide credit. So this quiz is short, it's only five questions long, and it is required for those of you who are looking to receive pesticide credit. So again, to emphasize it, um, uh, please remain on the webinar until it ends. Um, if you sign off before the webinar is completed and before you are prompted to take the quiz, you will not be allowed to retake it um, and unfortunately will not be awarded the pesticide credit. So hang in there with us. Um, I also want to remind our participants today um, as a part of the GoToWebinar uh, dashboard here, um, you can locate the questions area where you are welcome to type in questions that you have during today's presentation um, or shortly uh, at, at the end of the presentation and then I will moderate those questions um, uh, with our speaker today. So um, without further ado, I do want to introduce today's uh, speaker, Dr. Jaime Pinheiro, and he is with the UMass Stockbridge School of Agriculture and our Extension Fruit Program. And I'm going to switch um, the presentation over to Dr. Pinheiro. Um, he is going to be speaking to us today about an overview of spotted wing Drosophila monitoring and management options. And I also want to thank him for his um, uh, part and the role that he played in making this webinar series possible. Um, so thank you, Jaime, and take it away. So thank you, Tony. Good afternoon, everyone. So today I will be discussing what I call the one, two, three approach to managing a spotted wind drosophila, which is the shorter version of the title that uh, was this, um, presented by Tony. So this invasive insect has caused um, extensive damage in many areas of the U.S., um, including the Northeast. So back in 2013, um, the arrival of this pest to Missouri, that was the state where I used to work before moving to Massachusetts, this pest caused economic um, losses to small and mid-scale uh, growers. That was my target audience. So for my extension work in Missouri, I thought that the use of the term one, two, three, it was easy to understand and to implement by growers. So then I'm referring to this as the one, two, three approach uh, for SWU man management. So I'm pretty confident that every person uh, listening to this and uh, watching this webinar knows the significance of this pest. So in short, females lay the eggs inside the ripening fruit. Once the eggs are laid, they are protected. It's difficult 
not impossible to kill the, the larvae. So the adult flies are susceptible to many insecticides. And this, what, what makes management difficult is the following characteristics. Number one, you have multiple generations that overlap uh, throughout the summer. And that result, results in very high populations later in the summer. That will be late July and, and during August. Second, growers need to spray insecticides very close to harvest. And that means that what, whatever you choose to spray, they need to have a short pre-harvest intervals. And number three, because growers have to spray frequently against spotted winter sophila, then there is a need to rotate materials to minimize the effect of a, a resistance. And also these materials, they have to have a short pre-harvest intervals as well. Females have the ability to pierce the skin of the fruit using a, what is called serrated ovipositor, is the egg laying structure. You can see that on the left. So when you are trapping, when you are monitoring for this pest, you can identify the males by the presence of the one spot on the wing, on each wing. So the absence of such dot on the wings, that means that the fly could be either a spot in the of females, which lack the spot on the wings, or it could be a different Drosophila species, a native species. So you have to look at that uh, carefully. So this slide is just to highlight the high reproductive capacity of this uh, pest. In just three or four generations, you could go from very few individuals to hundreds of thousands. And that is because females have the ability to lay up to, let's say, 200 eggs in one month. So from those 200 eggs, when the larvae hatch is going to produce and females, half of them will be females, and so on. So this is uh, in the absence of any mortality factors. So it will not really happen in, in, in nature, but there is the potential to have thousands and thousands of flies. So to manage this uh, best Muted. way, we need to look at three important IPM components, which are monitoring, cultural practices, and insecticides. That's what I call the one, two, three approach for management. So for the reminder of this presentation, I will be describing each of these IPM strategies. So perhaps now you're wondering, what about biological control? That's an important component of IPM. Well, the bad news is that for any in invasive species, including the spotted Drosophila, when invasive organisms become established in a new country or region, they arrive without the insects, which are natural enemies, or the pathogens, that can cause diseases in the natural habitats. So we don't have effective biological control agents against uh, spotted wind drosophila at this moment. So the one, uh, um, the first step will be monitoring. The easiest and cheapest way to monitor for spotted wind drosophila, it will be using uh, traps, baited. Again, the cheapest and easiest is not, it's effective, but it's messy. That will be using the gist sugar bait. You don't have to include the sticky cards. That, that, used, that was done uh, many years ago. Um, so this material, however, attracts many non-target insects, which they can access in um, the trap because they respond to fermenting materials. So growers really don't use uh, uh, yeast and sugar and bait, even though it's very effective. So keep in mind that no matter what lure or bait you are using, the number of flies captured are not predictors of the level of infestation that you can uh, achieve uh, with this, uh, by this pest. So this means that when your crop is susceptible, changing color, and your traps capture spotted with drosophila, then it will be time to spray. So monitoring is more about the presence and absence of uh, in, uh, this spotted with drosophila, but it's not really going to predict injury. A number of companies have developed lures that you can buy now for monitoring. So examples include the ones that I'm showing in the picture on the left. That will be the uh, Alpha Sense and uh, the black uh, pouch, then the Tres Lure, and there is different uh, more options for. I'm uh, sorry, the the, the the bag, the clear bag is the uh, Sentry Lure, and there is also Tres Lures and other materials. In my opinion, and uh, those are not uh, cheap. So what I'm doing in my lab is investigating options which are cheaper and effective. So the second step in this one, two, three approach will be the implementation of at least one cultural practice. So this thing can really help uh, with management. The first one 
even though it's very simple, it's very effective. That would be sanitation. Just by removing the overripe fruit from the ground, from the, tree, from, from the plants, you can minimize uh, egg laying uh, activity and larval de development. Um, and growers in other regions, they are sending pickers to the fields. And these pickers have one container where they can place the fruit, which is marketable. And then the other container has the fruit that is uh, spoiled and needs to be removed from the field. So don't leave it in the field. So the second cultural practice that you can implement is canopy management. That means pruning and to open the canopy, to increase penetration by the insecticide, to increase coverage. And also by having less foliage, then there is the opportunity to uh, kill more, more flies. The, the foliage also, by removing the foliage, you can, have, you can make the crop somehow less attractive to the fly. The key is to open the canopy and to remove excess foliage. So the third option um, or a component is insecticides. So IPM also means applying insecticides when they are needed. And for spotted with Rosophila, the, the bad news is that you have to spray. So spotted with Rosophila is susceptible to many materials, but keep in mind that the timing of application and the coverage are very important for management. So my recommendation will be to use materials which are the least toxic to non-targets, um, including pollinators. But again, the key is to determine when to spray and really have good coverage. Before I proceed to uh, talk about the specific insecticides, I wanted to discuss uh, a recent study. It was published in the journal Insects by entomologists from Michigan State University, including Dr. Uh, John Weiss. Um, he has done a lot of research in this area. So they compared the efficacy of several, several materials to control the uh, spotted wind drosophila. I will show you the table in a moment. And they also evaluated the effect of simulated rainfall on residual activity. So they were uh, measuring adult mortality and also larval mortality in, in the fruit. They also um, analyzed the residues to determine to what extent they were washed off by the, by the rain. So they did chemical analysis and they uh, determined that the comparison was no rain, half an inch of rain and one inch of rain. So this table shows the six different materials that were evaluated. So they belong to six different IRAC groups. Among them, there is one biopesticide that contains naturally occurring bacterium, Chromobacterium subtugae, that will be Grandivo DF, which it has been shown to be effective against Spotted Drosophila and also against other insects. So the company claims that it's going to really become the next BT seems to be effective against a number of pests. So other insecticides include Exidel, Asael, Mustang Max, Paritroid, Delegate, which is an spinetolam active ingredient, Imidan, and Fosmet. So here is a summary of results. What I found is that all insecticides that were, uh, that were evaluated, they were very effective against um, spotted Drosophila adults when there was no rainfall. But even in the absence of rainfall, Asael killed the fewest adult spotted Drosophila. Then adult mortality and immature survival, that means the eggs and the larvae, um, they were affected by rainfall in the case of Imidan, Mustang Max, and Delegate. So when you have rainfall, even half an inch is going to reduce the performance. In terms of immature stages, the least affected materials were delegates and exidel. That means that these materials are able to penetrate the skin to some extent, and rainfall is going to not affect so much the performance of these materials compared to, for example, uh, imidan. When it comes to adults, even though when there was no rainfall, it was killing the least uh, number of spotted microsophila adults, in the presence of rain, it performed very well. So the materials stay um, in the foliage and in the fruit. So Asael and Exidel were the two most um, best performing um, materials when there was rainfall. When they did the residue analysis, they found that Fosmet, which is Imidan, 
they were very sensitive to wash off. Um, and interestingly, in the discussion, they mentioned that sometimes the materials can have rain fast properties. So they stay in the fruit, they stay in the foliage. But when, do the, when they do the biosays, they don't kill a lot of flies. So this is a very complex situation because we're talking about different active ingredients, different chemical classes. So there is a video by Dr. John Wise from Michigan State University. And um, I can share this link in a moment, but you can, if you're interested, he's going to explain what happens and potentially why this is happening. And it's a very interesting video uh, which explains uh, the residues and the rainfall effects, which it will be difficult to, to explain uh, uh, by me. So here I wanted to include one slide um, a couple of slides discussing organic insecticides. Some of you may be interested in organic materials. So some of the advantages of these um, materials is that they have shorter re-entry intervals. Sometimes it could be four hours. They have also shorter uh, pre-harvest intervals. You may already know about that. They are generally safe to plants, which means that there is no phytotoxicity. Other materials, it depends, uh, can damage uh, uh, foliage. There is also a low, low risk to the environment. So to non-targets, they're more selective, but they're also more expensive. So some, some examples in this table and are OMRI listed materials that are most commonly used against Potemon drosophila. As you can see, there is only one material, which is a spinosa uh, and thrust, which is considered to be effective and good performance in general. But if you, ask, if you ask me for a second suggestion, you can see that the rest are fair to poor. I would say a cera, it will be a material that can also show to be more effective, at least than pyganic. So the combination of pyrethrins and a, a pyganic, um, and I'm uh, sorry, um, as a directing, it will make a cera um, somewhat effective as a second option. Grandivo is, is shows to be fair uh, performance. So in this table, I would like to briefly discuss and trust delegate which is not listed for organic production, but is very effective against Potemus rosophila and also Acera. So if you are growing crops in, a, in your farm organically, but it's not certif certified organic, you could use Delegate, but you cannot use Delegate if you are certified organic. So I'm showing uh, the IRAC chemical group, which is Spinosins for Entrust and Delegate. They belong to the same group. And Acera belongs to the Paritrois Paritrins group, in IRAC in group, which is 3A. So in the first two cases, in the first case is microbial, is coming from the bacterium and Saccharidospora spinosa. In the second case, delegate is a second generation derivative, is a semi semi synthetic synthetic uh, material. So just because the company is changing the spinosa to make it better, just the process because of the process is is not approved for organic production. So in the case of Acera, it's a botanic botanical insecticide which is a combination of asadiractin, which is present in the seeds of the neem trees from India, and paritrins, so which is the active ingredient in pyganic. Properties, well, in the case of uh, entrust and delegate, they both are uh, in, a, in a fast way. They are primarily active by ingestion or contact, but when it comes to acera, it's a broad spectrum material and it's going to kill mostly by contact. So you spray when there is when there is the activity, acera is very toxic to, to bees. When it comes to residual, residual effect, well, for botanical insecticides, for microbial insecticides, they are degraded by UV light and heat. So that's one of the problems with organic materials, which they don't have long uh, residual effect. And when it comes to bee, tox bee toxicity, entrust and delegate are considered to be toxic, uh, but they are not such so toxic when the residue has dried up. Acera is highly toxic, again, against bees and other pollinators and other beneficial insects. Here I am presenting a table showing the label restrictions of entrust that will be by crop, just to give you more information about entrust. And so what you can see that while the application rates are similar among the crops, the pre-harvest intervals can be as short as one day for raspberry, or it could be as long as seven days for stone fruit. So the retreatment interval, you can spray every five days or every seven days, depending on the crop. 
and the maximum amount and the maximum number of applications are similar for each crop. So delegate, um, just one more slide. This slide was produced by Michigan State University entomologist about six years ago. I was hoping I could have an update, but I will get it soon. So it shows the performance of different insecticides in terms of efficacy against spotted wind drosophila. So this is based on a ranking that was done by entomologists around the country. And the number zero means that there is no activity, it's a very bad product. The number four is an excellent product. So what you can see is the average um, ranking. That means that most of the entomologists believe that, for example, in the case of delegate, it's a very effective material. It's an excellent material and trust is excellent, comparable to Exidel, comparable to Imidan, comparable to parithroids, such as Mustang Max. In, co in contrast, Pyganic, it was considered to be by most entomologists not to be very effective. So it's just a fair uh, ranking. So this table, uh, I hope uh, it shows that delegate and entrust, they're pretty effective. One of them is organic, one of them is close, close to organic, and then the other materials are uh, synthetic, except for Pyganic, which is botanical. So this information now comes from the label of Acera. Uh, again, it has, it's for organic production. It has 1.2% of active ingredient being acidic acting, and 1.4% is pyrethrins. So the label shows a long list of pests that you can kill. So I have used this material before to kill, difficult to kill pests such as uh, squash bugs in cucurbits, Japanese beetles in uh, organic and fruit crops, harlequin bugs in brassicas, so in my opinion, it's one of the best options for organic uh, uh, management and, and because there are not many options uh, for growers. Well, however, it's expensive. So for more detailed information about materials that you can apply uh, against spotted wind drosophila in the Northeast, you have the access to the New England Small Fruit Management Guide, which uh, provides information about the management on strawberries, blueberries, brambles, grapes, etc. So this table that I'm presenting now shows, um, is coming from the New England Management Guide, and it shows the efficacy of 21 products. I couldn't bring the whole list because it would be hard to see, for brambles that will be against, against multiple insects. So you have a list of 21 chemicals, the IRAC group in, in a blue box, so how effective are those mat materials against aphids, leaf hoppers, et cetera? So let's focus on spotted wind drosophila. So those materials that have three plus signs, for example, assail or um, brigade, they are very effective against spotted wind drosophila. Um, examples include the neonicotinoids and the parithroid group and the spinosin group, which is delegate. And also in trust, but it's not in the list. I, just, I couldn't get it. So those materials with two plus signs um, are moderately effective. And those materials with just one plus sign are the least effective. You can see some um, materials, there is no information. So that means that nobody has tested the efficacy of those materials against spotted wind drosophila. Here I'm just uh, showing to you the different chemical groups. So when you see group uh, 4A, you know is that neonicotinoids. There is a Grandivo, which is now included in, in this list, and um, is for organic production. And th there is no classification for uh, according to the IRAC group. And nobody has tested really how effective this uh, material is against Potemetrosophila, according to the, to the guide. There is no rec new research that shows that it's effective, was somehow effective. So one recommendation is that for all insecticides, in particular for Spinoza and Spinetoram, which is and trust and delegate, we recommend that you uh, add sugar to the tank because fruit flies, they have sponging and lapping mouth parts, so they cannot chew the material. They're going to suck up the material uh, using these uh, uh, proboscis. So they have to feed on liquids. When you add sugar as a phagoid stimulant, it's going to induce feeding. That means that the material is more likely to kill after the residue is dry. So after you spray the following days, the residue will have some sugar and the flies will sense the sugar with the feed and then they will start feeding. As they feed, they can ingest more material and they're more likely to, to die 
and there is papers published on, on this showing that it helps with this price. So that next I would like to discuss um, what can I do or what can you do to reduce insecticide in use? I will discuss um, two different uh, alternatives or uh, supplementary um, um, activities. The first one is exclusion. So for small plantings, of course, it will not be uh, useful for large plantings. For high tunnels, one option is, is to use a fine mesh screen that is going to exclude pollinators. So you're going using high tunnels, well, you, you have to uh, be able to allow them to, to pollinate the crop. Then if you are finding the spotted window sophila by trapping inside the high tunnel after you have the net, you have to probably spray an insecticide to clean up the, the, the plants, the, the high tunnel, and then uh, you may not have to spray again against uh, these insects. And there, there are a number of studies um, done in high tunnels showing that this is a useful activity. So one example, uh, as you see, uh, in 2018, Sonny Sloman, she um, developed this structure. It's, uh, the cost was about $300 for the frame, about $300 for the netting. So the materials were in PVC pipe and some pressure treated, uh, treated lumber, some netting. So the length of the tunnel was about 100 feet. And the crop, it was raspberries. So at the end of the season, just in this small area, they were able to harvest uh, worth of uh, uh, the crop value was $1,200 and they didn't spray any insecticides or fungicides. So the net that we have been using is coming from Canada, it's Protect Net, and we'll give you some information about the cost. Um, I think it's a strong material, so it can last several years, uh, but it's one of the options. So the second thing I would like to discuss is uh, the performance of diluted Concord grape juice. As I said before, well, I have been trying to determine how you can use materials which are cheaper and easy to get. So the goal of this uh, study, or it was not one study, it was a numerous studies, it started in 2018. So we tested the effectiveness of uh, different fruit juices that include blueberry and uh, uh, grape, apple, etc., which are, again, cheap and easy to find, easy to get. So we found that Concord grape use was among the most effective. Then we started testing different dilutions and we found that when you test one part of juice and three parts of water, it becomes a very attractive material for spotted window sophila. So here what I'm doing in this particular study, I was comparing traps baited with the one to three dilution. A second treatment, it was a grape juice diluted with some plant volatiles added and I compared those two treatments against century lure, which is the commercial lure. What you can see in this graph is the average number of male and female spotted wind drosophila according to treatment. So in the, with the red and arrows, what you can see is that the one to three dilution of juice, it was about three times more effective or more attractive to the females, also to the males, than the sentry uh, lure, which is one of the options that you have uh, for commercial lures. But not only that, we found that when you also count the non-target uh, insects captured in traps, the one to three dilution of grape juice attracted about three to four times fewer non-targets. So a higher proportion of flies captured in traps were spotted with Drosophila, and in particular females. So last year we did a study um, and the goal was to um, determine how effective is the diluted grape juice at detecting the first spotted wind drosophila in traps in Massachusetts. So we had five locations in Massachusetts. Each location has three different traps. One has the diluted uh, Concord grape juice. Second one has the Sentry lure and the third trap has the Alpha Sense lure. So all the traps were deployed in late April and they were inspected twice a week. Only the juice was replaced every two, every week. So every two times that we inspected the traps, the, the, the juice was replaced. So this is what, what we found. What you can see here is the mean number of um, spotted wind drosophila adults combining females and males according to treatment for each trapping date. 
So the first adults that we, the traps captured, they were found around 16, the 16th or 17th of May. And that trap was baited by, with a grape juice. So the following date, which is 20 to 23rd of May, nothing was captured. The next time that we found insects on traps, I mean, spotted with Drosophila, it was on the 27th, 29th of May. It was only in traps baited with the spotted with Drosophila. I'm sorry, with the diluted grape juice. Then what you can see is that uh, after that, the sentry lure and the alpha sense, they start catching flies. But one date, which is the last date for this figure, which is June 17th, basically the grape juice was capturing about eight times more um, spotted with Drosophila than the sentry lure. Just for that date, alpha cents didn't catch in spotted with Drosophila. So what I so what I showed you before is the combination of male and females in traps. But when I did a, an examination and we determined, okay, which proportion of the traps are females, you can see that less than 10% of the flies in sentry lures, using sentry lure, are females. So 95% are males, similar to alpha cents. But in contrast, about 90% of the flies captured by the diluted grape juice, they were females. So this grape juice also seems to be catching more females than the other two commercial lures. Then we continue um, the trapping um, until late August. This is just showing to you in Belcher Town in the, at the UMass Cold Spring Orchard, the seasonal captures of males, which is blue line, and females, which is the orange line, in traps baited with um, grape juice, diluted grape juice, from early May to late August. So as you can see, in 2019, captures were very low until late June, when populations started to increase. Then there was a second peak that started in late July, and that continued until late August. We also have done experiments in the laboratory using large cages, comparing how effective is the diluted grape juice against commercial lures. But in this case, I know how many flies I'm releasing. So one cage, for example, has 15 males, 15 females, and it has a trap with a sentry lure. And a different cage has the same number of flies, males and females, and a different uh, material like grape juice, and then etc. So what we found is that we were um, checking the traps in these cages at six hours overnight, which is about 15 hours after deploying, and then at 24 hours. So what I'm going to present is the proportion of flies, the percentage that was captured in traps according to sex of the flies and the treatment. So this is a cumulative response. If I release 15 males every time, well, which proportion was killed by, by the traps? With the sentry lure, what you can see is that no difference uh, between males and females. So the traps on average are killing about less than 40% of the flies that I release. With alpha scents, it's not a big difference, but it's the, in this case, it's no more than 30% for the males. But when you go to this uh, diluted grape juice, it's, cut, it's killing about 60% of the males that I release, but also it's killing more than 85% of the females that I release. So again, this is validation that the diluted grape juice seems to be attractive to females. Cost considerations, well, when you buy half a gallon, one two liter bottle of um, grape juice, you pay X amount of money. That um, volume of juice is enough to prepare 7.6 liters of the diluted um, solution. And then if you apply 200 milliliters, around six ounces of juice, diluted juice in traps, you can prepare 38 traps with 350. And not including the cost of the traps that you can make on, in your house. So in this case, the cost of the bait is about nine cents per trap. And the cost of a single lure, in this case, I'm showing as an example, sentry lure, it will be around seven dollars, seven fifty. So in 2020, we are also monitoring for the early season activity using traps in four locations. 
So in this case, we have five different treatments. One is the diluted Concord grape juice, one to three dilution. The second is Centrilure. The third treatment is Alpha Sense. And then we're testing uh, two Tresem uh, lures, which you can buy. Um, those are, uh, one of them is broad spectrum, and the fifth uh, Tresem lure is um, more selective, according to the company. So, so far, we have not captured any flies, and uh, we're inspecting the, these uh, traps once a week. So, the last slide that I have um, is what about trap out? Can you use diluted grape juice to kill spotted wind drosophila before you have to start spraying insecticides? Well, I have, I have not really tested this uh, idea in the field. I hope to be able to do this yet, but I think it's going to be a little difficult. So before, you, before your crop is susceptible, before you have to spray insecticides, there will be some flies which are active. Can you have 10, 15, 20 traps around the field and just in a passive way kill adults, spotted wind drosophila? So that will be an inexpensive way to kill insects without effort, just placing the traps and leave them, maybe replace once a week the, the juice. But then uh, in other places, in other regions, some people have done similar work. And what they're finding is that in general, the traps don't seem to be very effective. You may have a very good attractant, but the trapping system seems not to be ideal for spotted wind drosophila, because in Michigan and in other locations, when they have done research, there seems to be more injury in areas which are close to the traps, where the traps are, compared to traps which are in, or in, away from the crop or compared to the crop which has no traps. So at this moment, I am not recommending uh, trapping uh, using the juice, but it's again an inexpensive way of killing as many as you can before you have to spray. But we have to do the research to determine how effective it is. In 2019, I did a small experiment in a raspberry uh, field. It was about three acres. So half of the field was uh, surrounded with um, traps, baited with the uh, diluted grape juice. The other half was not, didn't have any traps. We have monitoring traps in the center with a different commercial lure. And the grower was spraying every week or every seven to 10 days. So the two halves were sprayed. But in addition, one half had the traps. And what I found, I'm not, I, am not, I am not presenting the results at this moment, is that indeed there seems to be a little more injury when you have the traps compared to when you don't have them. And that could be explained by the bait attracting the flies, but the traps not being able to, to kill them. I mean, with the, they don't get inside in, in, in high numbers, like, as I will hope. So that's all what I have to say. It has been in about 40 something minutes. So. I guess if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jaime. Um, yes, I do have some questions uh, that folks have been sending while you were presenting. And again, I encourage others who have additional questions to submit them in the question area uh, by typing them in. So your first one, Jaime, is from William. Um, he asks, how does netting impact production? Does reduced exposure to sunlight under the netting reduce harvest quantity or quality? Well, I have not done any, any work in that area, but what I know is that I don't think it's going to affect production uh, if you have enough pollination. I think one of the risks may be more about uh, fungicides, I mean, application and diseases that can develop inside the structure because you are not really, because there is decreased air circulation. So if there is an effect, it, it will probably be because of uh, diseases, but I don't think it's because of light and effects. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Dan. Um, what does the grape juice trap look like? Um, for example, what are the dimensions or uh, hanging location for those? Yes, well, the research has been done using, for example, cherry trees. So we have been placing the traps at eye level, and we are somehow trying to protect the liquid from uh, heat. So we don't expose really the trap to the sunlight because it's going to ferment the grape juice. And we have, we have found 
that when you have fermented grape juice, it's going to bring more spotting with Drosophila, but also many more non-targets. So we have been um, in raspberry, we have been placing the trust very low in the canopy because that's the location where the flies are more likely to um, be active. So they like low, um, high humidity areas with um, like a low, low elevation in the, within the canopy. So in raspberry, low in the canopy. In cherry trees, for example, I, will, I have been placing them at eye level in the outer um, part of the canopy, but trying to avoid the heat, the heat this direct sunlight. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Kathleen. Uh, how many pollinators were trapped uh, or were pollinators trapped in the diluted Concord grape juice in the fields? Well, what I can tell you is that because we were using these traps, which have very small holes, they only allow spotting with Drosophila and small insects, I mean, similar size, to get inside. So there is no chance for, there is no chance for honeybees and other insects which are bigger in size to get inside the trap. So I don't know how attractive the material is, but we just didn't find insects in traps which are larger than the spotted wind drosophila. Excellent. Um, the next question I have one from Lawrence: Are spotted wing drosophila increasing or decreasing? Well, within the season. As soon as you find the, fee, the first spotted wind drosophila, I think in, in, a, in the Hudson Valley, they just found the first one. It's going to be several weeks before they start really increasing in population. But the highest numbers are going to be in late July and during August. Now, if your question is comparing different years, I would say that this flight came to stay and it's going to be, you can expect high numbers every year, in my opinion, late August and uh, early during August and late July. Early in the season, I think every year it's going to be like a not so high numbers. Uh, so the early season crops will be less at, at less risk than the late season crops. Thank you. Uh, um, the question. Uh, another question that I have here is from Oh, it got moved from Beverly. Is it really possible to get fallen fruit off the ground economically? Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, I don't have an answer to that because it depends how much fruit is on the ground and how late in the season is. I mean, it's, so I think it depends on the on the person. I mean, it's uh, on the farm. I don't have numbers to, to share. I mean, when it comes to how much time you spend picking X volume of fruit to eliminate X number of larvae, it's hard to, to answer that question. Thank you. No, nope, that's that's fine. Um, uh, another question from Tori. In Maine, we have been using red solo cups to build traps. Are the clear deli containers considered better? No, I, I think the red traps are better than these ones. This is just the experiments that we did to test the effect of odor, no color. So, but now this year I could have students comparing the same traps that I'm showing painted red because it's going to be the same size, color versus no color, meaning red versus clear. And I expect the red to be really helping to bring the flies. These flies respond very strongly to red color. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question here from James. How much sugar per gallon do you recommend to increase effectiveness of the insecticide? Yes, uh, I think it's, you know, for a small backpack, um, it will be five tablespoons per gallon, but if you're going to use a large sprayer, it will be two pounds per hundred gallons of water. It's like, will be like a 2% solution. Can you see the, the, the slide? Yes. Okay, nope. just as a, a reminder that I think it would be about two pounds of sugar per hundred gallons of water, or in a, for a backpack sprayer, five tablespoons per gallon of water. Some people are concerned about the potential att attraction of bees to the dry uh, material, but the amount of sugar, I think, is pretty low to really bring in other insects in. So the spotting with Drosophila, they're coming to the foliage anyway, because they are attracted by the fruits and the 
odor of the plant. So I don't think it's high risk for other insects that want to feed on the sugar. Thank you. Um, another question here from Lindsay. Just out of curiosity, since spotted wing Drosophila are drawn to your grape juice solutions, do you think conquered grapes planting on the perimeter of crops um, and how many feet away would pull them to those grapes and away from the target crop? Um, so like your attract and kill basically, is, or yeah. is it more problematic than it is worth? I think it will be more problematic. And um, you're talking about trap cropping, and I think it's just it will take a long time to do the research, and it will I will find this to be difficult to implement by growers. And um, so it's uh, I don't think it will be feasible to use grapes as a trap crop for this insect in blueberries or in other. Uh, so that's that's my opinion. Thank you. Um, uh, another question here. Oh, they keep coming in. A lot of good questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, from Beverly, has any biological control been found? Which well, you may have answered that. I don't remember. Well, I say that they were not effective biological control agents at this moment, but there has been some parasitic wasps which are attacking the native species, but I don't think they're going to be in such a high numbers to control the spotted wing drosophila. So it's, um, there are some predatory insects, but I think none of them are going to reproduce as fast as this fly to control populations. Thank you. Um, another question from Dan. Under cultural practices, uh, where are spotted wing drosophila overwintering? Any use to adding heavy mulches annually? And um, well, the spotted wing drosophila adults overwinter primarily close to the forest under the litter. I don't know to what extent they can overwinter under the canopy of the plants. I, I think it's unlikely. So I don't think the mulching would help with reducing the overwintering populations of the fly. They will be coming anyway from forested areas. And as soon as they become active in the spring, they're going to be reproducing on fruits, which are wild fruits in the forest. Um, and then they're moving moving onto your crop. I don't think the flies that are coming to your crop spend the winter in your field. Thank you. Um, another question from Kathleen. Has anyone made a resistant hybrid of raspberry um, that does not attract spotted wing drosophila? The answer is no, to my knowledge. They, some people have been evaluating repellents. I mean, something that you can spray to the crop to push them away. And I think the, the most important uh, management option for it will be to have a late, cult uh, sorry, early cultivars as opposed to late cultivars. But I, don't, I am not aware of any hybrid or any um, material which is resistant to this insect. Thank you. Um, another question from Kathleen. It seems to me that using the diluted conquered grape juice would be more organic uh, in comparison to using insecticides. I guess, can you comment on that? Yes, what I can say is that in organic systems, in non-organic systems, I would say you still have to spray. So the diluted grape juice maybe can help, but it's not going to eliminate the sprays. So then, uh, yes, I think can be used in organic systems. Yes, talk to your certifier because you can use uh, materials that are inside traps as long as they don't contact the crop, unless you use organic uh, uh, grape juice. I mean, I, I think in any system can be used, but it's not going to replace the insecticides. Thank you. Um, another question, would replacing berries with early season varieties be worth investigating for reducing spotted wing drosophila damage from Donna? My short answer is yes. And in this case, I'm happy to get more information about which cultivars are early season for this re region. I don't know where uh, you live, but I think that most people are really paying attention to that as an, as an alternative, growing early season cultivars 
but I don't have information in my brain about which cultivars you can grow. I mean, I don't have the names, but I can find information for you. Donna says she is from Rhode Island, just to give you follow up on that. Um, <laughs> another question from uh, Marjorie, um, could someone have a controlled animal eat the fruit on the ground? Yes, I just don't have any specific examples. The example that I, comes to my mind is coming from Michigan in apple, organic apple orchards, where people are, I mean, that, that was research. They were using pigs to eat the apples that were on the ground, but of course that's not compatible with the safety um, situation in, at the farm with the, so there is an opportunity there, but I don't know perhaps rodents or birds, but I am not sure about what you can do to make animals to eat that and fast. Interesting, thank you. I didn't realize there was such research out there. Oh yeah, uh, there was, they were using pigs to eat and the drop, drop them, the falling apples in Michigan. It was very effective, but you cannot really bring, use pigs for commercial uh, purposes. Thank you. Um, I think probably our last question here uh, from Lawrence um, asking about um, recommending using hummingbird feeders. Um, and I'm not sure if that is in, uh, it says to increase the number of hummingbirds um, or if that's uh, an alternate type of trapping system. Well, you know what, that's very interesting because I have been reading about that. There has been an re reports that you can use um, hummingbird feeders because hummingbirds, they eat so many insects, I think it's thousands per day. So I think will be a, a suggestion. I just don't have the density or a, a specific information, but the idea seems to be very good. And I have read that it seems to be working, I mean, in some places. It's, it's some help. I mean, you have to spray insecticides anyway, but it can also help reduce populations. Well, excellent. Um, Dr. Pinheiro, this was great. Um, my, your presentation was excellent, and thank you for fielding so many um, great and varied questions from our audience. I really appreciate the audience engagement. Um, so with that, I will uh, switch us over, since we don't have any more questions, um, to uh, Jeffrey's screen.